Welcome to another eddycurrent.com podcast. And today's topic, we will be talking about coil merit. Coil merit, or Q factor of the coil, defines the ability and the efficiency of an inductor to induce current in itself, or the ease at which and the efficiency at which a coil acts as an inductor. For an inductor to act efficiently, it will generate a robust magnetic field with minimal losses from heat. Now, I've taken countless ET exams over the years, and I'm always happy when the question pops up about coil merit, because it seems like all they ever ask is, what's the formula for coil merit? Well, that's inductive reactance divided by resistance, XL over R. The higher the inductive reactance, the higher the coil merit, or the higher the Q. So it's always a free, you know, free point when you get that question, but that's kind of where it stops. Over the years when I've gone and looked up in, you know, training books and literature and publications, you know, what about coil merit? Give me some more information on coil merit. There's not a lot. It's just the higher the Q, the better the coil acts as an inductor. I'm going to break it down for you a little bit, but we first have to start with the inductance formula. So coil inductance is a fixed value. The factors that determine coil inductance are based on coil design. So if you look at the formula, you've got, you know, number of turns of the coil, the thickness of the coil, the length of the coil, the number of windings in the coil, all of those things contribute to the inductance value. Now inductance is a component of inductive reactance. So inductive reactance depends on the coil inductance out of the box and then the test frequency that you're driving that coil at. And then of course, resistance is fixed based on the type of wire and length of wire, thickness, etc. You know that if you have a coil and it's got a certain coil merit value or a Q factor of X, if you raise the test frequency, you're gonna raise the coil merit. So whenever I see anything about coil merit, I always ask myself, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? Why do I care about coil merit? And here's the thing. It's kind of like Dr. Forrester's similarity law. Back when Dr. Forrester was cranking out eddy current material and doing his groundbreaking test that nobody else ever heard of before, he had to come up with his own logic. He had to figure things out for himself because he was starting from ground zero. And there has been a lot of formulas and terms and methodologies, ways of doing things over the years that had to take place when they did, but don't necessarily have to be done anymore because we found a better way to do things. So over the years, we stopped dealing less with the similarity law because we have figured out other formulas such as the F90 formula, you know, to accomplish what we need to determine the correct frequencies for a certain thickness of a certain type of material. So we don't care about the similarity law anymore. We use other means to achieve our goals. Now, getting back to the coil merit, if you forgot everything you learned in this video about coil merit, it won't really matter. But if you remember what I tell you, you can get a free point on an exam probably. If you know how test frequency is related to depth of penetration and how material properties and test frequency can affect eddy current density and depth of penetration, you're pretty much good. A coil with a high coil merit has to start off with a decent amount of inductance and then as you drive the test coil higher it's going to raise your inductive reactance and therefore raise your coil merit so a tiny coil with high coil merit out of the box is probably going to have pretty decent skin effect and very you know limited depth of penetration increasing the test frequency is going to increase the skin effect it's going to lower the depth of penetration Now, on the other hand, if you take a big wide coil that doesn't have a lot of coil windings and it's kind of a longer coil, that may be, you know, good for finding large bulk flaws and it may have a good depth of penetration, but it's probably going to have a lower Q factor. Now, if you raise the test frequency, you are raising inductive reactance, but it had a low Q factor to begin with. So it's not like you're going to turn that coil into a super great inductor just because you raise the test frequency. So... Coil merit and inductive reactance and coil design are all sort of interrelated. But again, if you know 
the fundamentals about how test material properties and test frequency affect your depth of penetration, you're probably good. The bottom line is when you're preparing for an exam, you do your research, you talk to your probe supplier, you look at the last inspection, you use all the tools you have to figure out what the best coil design is for the inspection you're going to do. Then you get the proper CAL standard, and then you get out your calculator or your slide rule, and you look at the frequencies they used last time, you use all these things. And then the ultimate test always comes back to using an applicable calibration standard and making sure that your test system and the way it's configured, you're able to see the representative flaws in the calibration standard for what you expect or have the potential to come across during your inspection. The CAL standard is the ultimate test as long as you're using a good CAL standard. And again, if I've got any of this wrong, please leave a comment below. I always like to learn new things. Thanks for watching.